Okay, that's a beautiful hymn. Thanks for playing that, Craig. Beautiful trusting in him. Let's just pray, shall we? Father in heaven, only with divine insight can we understand your word and only by the power and grace of your spirit can we apply it. And so we just thank you for your willingness, your desire, your love, your patience with your children. So be with us today, speak to us, transform us through your word. We pray in Jesus name, amen. Today, we, our subject is the how to live the triumphant life. How do you live the Christian life? So many people struggle. They have a desire. They want to, they want to live victoriously. Uh, they trip up and fall and all kinds of things happen, which discourage them. But today we want to focus on the, tri the life triumphant. And we're going to look at it in four parts. The possibility, the necessity, the difficulty, and the master manner of accomplishment. How do we live this life? So first of all, the possibilities. And I hope you have your Bibles because we're going to go to two particular Psalms, which are the best in clarifying what it, the possibilities and what God's plan and intention is. And Psalm 19 and Psalm 37. I'll just give you a chance to find that, Psalm 19 and chapter 37. In Psalm 19 and verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So right here in this first verse, in verse 7, it emphasizes the source of power of transformation. He said, is the law of the Lord is perfect. What is the law of the Lord? It's the very character of God. It's the very presence of God. Because the law is the presence of God. The Ten Commandments are a transcript of his character in written form. But the law is God. And it says the law of the Lord is perfect or complete, fully functional to bring about a conversion of the soul. So the transformation does not begin with us, with our effort. It comes as a promise here. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord, verse 8, are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Now, here is the, the process by which this transformation takes place. First of all, the assurance in verse 7 that it's the law of the Lord, it's the presence of God that transforms. And it's sure. And it makes wise the simple. So here is the understanding. I, I need to understand. So now... Verse 8 and following now is the is the step-by-step -step understanding of that process. It says the statutes of the Lord are right, they're straight, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. So we have rejoicing. Uh, the eye is enlightened, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, the judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Verse 11, moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his error? Now here comes the other part. Without the word of God, you and I do not understand that there is even error in our heart. And we're gonna look at that later on. But it says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And we find this. Expressed in the experience of Jacob in Genesis 32 and verse 26. Remember when he said, 
wrestling with Christ himself as, as that angel. He said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Jacob knew that he needed something more, and he knew that only God could give it to him. He needed God's blessing. He recognized his need. And David in Psalm 139 and verse 23 said, search me, O God, and try me. And know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. So you and I come to God and say, God, I, I, it's like the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, Lord, and he says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He realized that something was missing. He was doing everything right. That's what he said. Kept all the commandments. But he, he had this, he knew within himself that something was missing. And he says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so with many Christians who desire to do the will of God, to live in the will of God, we have this desire. And so that's what we want to look at today. How do we know the will of God? How can we get this blessing that Jacob desired so much? And how can our eyes be opened to those se the secret sins of our life of where we are not in perfect harmony with the will of God? that God needs to reveal to us, uh, that we of ourselves don't know and don't understand. And so in verse 14, Psalm 19 and verse 14, it says, David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And there is the emphasis upon that. The strength, God is his strength, and God is his redeemer. You and I can't save ourselves. We can't change one thing about ourselves. But God is the strength, he is the will, he is the passion to, to be transformed and to be changed into his likeness. And he is my redeemer. I can't save myself. So there we have those steps. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It's the presence of God. And so we have to ask ourselves today, where am I? Where am I in this process, in the sense of the presence of God? Do you delight in God? Do you delight to be in his presence? Do you delight to think of him, to put him first in your life every day? Where is he? How often do you think of him? How often do you tell God, I love you? It's being in the presence of God and keeping him ever in your thoughts that the transformation takes place. And what we're looking at here today is the fact that we may have these desires, but really the, the bottom line, the basis of this desire is the fact that I have to decide that I am going to heaven. If that's the purpose of your life, if that's your objective, that's your intent, then, then it will become easy. But you have to decide where you're going to spend your destiny. Because heaven is living in the presence of God. That's what it's all about. And if I desire to live in his presence in the future, then I must learn to enjoy being in his presence now. And so it's that decision. If you decide you're going to spend eternity with God, then it makes it so much easier. But you have to decide, and you've, I've said it before, and I, keep, I will keep saying it. <laughs> when my grandmother taught me as a child, that's what she said, decide where you're going to spend eternity, and every other decision will be easy. Because anything that's not going to get you there is rejected. Anything that will move you there, you will entertain. And so I say to you today, in living the Christian life, it will only become easy when you decide, when you decide that you're going to spend eternity with God. You are going to heaven, and you will let nothing stand in your way. Because persecution will come. All kind of temptations will come. And the devil uses subtle distractions, innocent distractions, to keep us from really focusing upon our relationship with God. But as David said here, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The presence of God is what transforms us. 
and brings to us the joy, the great blessing that is promised in this psalm. Okay, Psalm 37 is the other one I want to refer to before we begin here. It says, trust in the, verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good, and so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily shalt thou be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Then verse 7, he says, rest in the Lord. Verse 9, he says, wait upon the Lord. <clears throat> and then the assurance of the, of the ending of all this, he says, for yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So we have all of these assurances, and I would encourage you, if there is any doubt in your mind at any time, go back to Psalm 19, go back to Psalm 37. Uh, all of these assurances are there for our blessing. Okay. The first step, the possibility. What is the possibility of actually living that life of God, that holy life that Jesus says, be holy for I am holy. Be ye therefore perfect. How can we live this life? What are the possibilities? Well, first of all, how can it be done? And Jesus said, our Lord's clear note of triumph comes ringing across the centuries. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. And he goes on to say, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So here's the assurance, first of all, is the, po the possibilities of that Jesus came, and here is where we, we must understand the very nature of Christ that he took our humanity. He had no advantage, no, uh, nothing that we do not possess did he possess. Sure, he was totally God, but he never used his divine power to accomplish anything to live our life. Because in order for him to live your life, he could not have any advantage that do, you do not have. Otherwise, he wasn't living your life. He had an advantage that you don't have, and therefore there was no possibility for you to ever live that life. But Jesus had no advantage. He took our humanity, the weakness that sin had brought over 4,000 years, and he assumed that, and he still has it to this day. Remember, Jesus took our humanity forever. That's why the role of the Holy Spirit is so important. So the possibilities are that Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Therefore, my victory is assurance of your victory because I lived your life. I lived it perfectly and I empower, I give you the same power, the same Holy Spirit power that gave me victory whenever I was here on earth. And Paul could say, I have fought the good fight. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And Paul's emphasis here is the fact that the Christian life is not, you know, it, it's not a beach party. It is a battle. And that battle really is with self. That's the enemy that we have to contend with every day because self wants to rise up. It wants to be in charge. It wants to do what pleases it, what pleases myself rather than what pleases God and what pleases other people. But Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And therefore, that is the second point of the assurance of possibility. Jesus did it. Paul said that he did it. And that... Uh, let's read another text, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now, thanks be unto God, which causes us to triumph 
in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So there we have that assurance that we now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes us the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. So there we have the possibilities. God has assured us that it has, it has been accomplished through Christ. Paul gave us the assurance, and then we have the assurance that it will be accomplished in us. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the point of this first, the possibility, is that because God has already lived this life, Paul gives us the assurance that he has lived this life. And if that is so, then you have to see, our, you have to see yourself as victorious. If you don't see yourself defeating sin in your own life, defeating self in your own life, then you will never be victorious. You have to see yourself victorious. Well, just come with David. All of the other great men of the nation of Israel were fearful of fighting Goliath. They didn't see themselves as overcomers. They didn't see themselves victorious. And therefore, they never stepped out in faith to do what that lad did who came and said, I'll face Goliath. Why? Because he had already been assured of victory. God had already given him that assurance. He didn't know what that battle was that he was going to fight, but he knew that he would be facing something of which God gave him the assurance of victory. And he, in all those days where he was practicing with a slingshot, that was practiced, prompted by the Holy Spirit because God knew what he was preparing him for. And so you and I in our daily life, maybe it's not practicing with a slingshot. Maybe it's reading the word, listening to the word, memorizing the word, just keeping your thoughts on God. These are the habits that you keep developing every day because there is a battle coming and God will prompt you as to what you need to be doing. And so David could walk out there and face what no one else was daring to face because he saw himself victorious. And then you go to the Battle of Jericho. What were they told to do? While they were marching around the city, they were to be silent. But on that seventh time around, on the seventh day, they were to shout a shout of victory. Not an arrow had been fired, not a javelin thrown, nothing had been done to win that city, to conquer that city, but their shout of victory is what broke the walls down. Sure, God did it, but it was their confidence that God would do it, and so you and I, in living our daily life, God says, I want you to shout for victory when the devil wants to discourage you and take you down whenever you stumble and fall, as we read in Psalm 37, you may stumble and fall, but you're going to get up. God says, whenever you fall, shout victory. Instead of mumbling and complaining and, and criticizing yourself and say, I did it again, God says, shout vict the victory, because you have it. You have it, I assure you. And so you and I must see ourselves as victorious Christians. If you don't, you won't. It will, be an, it will be a very difficult Christian life. You may be saved, but uh, you could live a much easier, better life if you will do it God's way in the sense of trusting him completely. Number two, the necessity. <laughs> As you know, the saddest verse in the Bible is Jeremiah 8.20, the harvest is past. The summer has ended, and we are not saved. Why? Why would the harvest pass, the summer ended, and we are not saved? What would keep us from being saved? In Matthew 20 and verse 16, it says, 
For many are called, but few have chosen. That word are should be crossed out and written have. For many are called, but few are chosen. And another verse says, few have chosen. Few have chosen. Many professing Christians will be rejected. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. In thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. These verses in harmony with others clearly show that there is a standard to be met as a test of eternal fellowship with God. There is a standard. And many will be there on that day thinking that they are going to be saved. And they will list all the things that they've done. But it didn't qualify them. Because in Hebrews 12 and verse 14, it says, Holiness without which man, no man shall see the Lord. God's standard is not impossible. We've already read that. Jesus has already lived your life victorious. Paul fought the battle. He lived it victoriously. So what is it that will keep so many people out of the kingdom who thought that they were saved. The standard is holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now we have a problem in the Adventist church. You've heard of soft swearing like G, golly, G whiz. That's called soft swearing. We have a form of soft purgatory. Yep, we do. Because many, many people think that somehow, even though the standard of God is holiness, in other words, holiness is simply God. Holiness, holy. As I am holy, he is W-H-O-L-L-Y. I am holy gods. That somehow I do not have to be holy gods I can still retain my anger, my impatience, my uh, dishonesty, uh, my lack of diligence, my carelessness in different ways. All the little things that are not a part of the life of heaven. You know, the, will, your, will your language, will the way in which you speak to people in your home, outside your home, would that be acceptable in heaven? you shout? Do you raise your voice? Do you get angry? Is that going to be a part of heaven? Is that a part of the holy life? As long as you think with that you are somehow that before the Lord comes, he's just going to rapture that out of your life. That's why all those people, the goats in Matthew 25 and these people in Matthew 7, were so disappointed because they did all the good things. They went to church, Sabbath school. They helped out in, you know, Adra. They, you know, they distributed books. They did all kinds of things, but they're lost. Is because in their personal life, they justified, they allowed, they tolerated attitudes, spirits, behaviors that will not be a part of heaven that make angels weep. And so we call that soft purgatory. The devil carried that over to the Catholic Church because now you have another chance. You can die and you're lost, but you go to purgatory so that you can be redeemed. Of course, it makes money for the church. Uh, it's a two-edged sword. And so somehow we believe in a purgatory where uh, I'm going to have a second chance. I'm going to die with all these things in my life. Probation is closed. You know, I die suddenly, whatever happens, uh, and it's still in me. I've never dealt with it. That somehow God's going to take it out of my life. 
It may be a cup of coffee. I have no idea. But there are things in our lives that that's why David said, search me, O God. I, I didn't realize that that was not acceptable, Lord. But as I read your word, as I read the spirit of prophecy, the counsel that you've given to us, I am suddenly confronted with the fact that that is not acceptable. And what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about that? Am I going to deal with it instantly or am I going to justify well, uh, I'll deal with that later. I know it's wrong, but I like it. It's not all that bad. There's a lot of other people that do it too. Matter of fact, we even have a coffee machine at our church. Yeah, we can justify that, but we don't justify it to God. And God says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That's the standard, the necessity that we face in our daily life of what am I going to do with this? You've all heard the, the terms imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. One is our title to heaven, that's justification. And our fitness for heaven is sanctification. And God is responsible for this. And he says, if you will come to me, I will give you rest. That's the rest he's talking about, not the physical rest of, from exhaustion, but the rest from the tyranny and the power and the struggle against self, against sin. God says, simply come to me, trust me. And in the trusting, because you see, it's the influence. See, the sun doesn't do anything, but it has an influence. And so that's what God is. As you come to the word of God, it has a transforming power that we're trying to fight a battle. God says, don't fight it. You can't win. But if you'll come to me, if you will trust me and allow the Holy Spirit to point out those issues in your life, which are a, creating a barrier between you and me, you and I will spend eternity together. So it takes the struggle out of it. it. We have to strive, yes, to strive to enter in at the straight gate. For straight is the way, and straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. And so there is a striving, there is a struggle, but the struggle is not for me to overcome. The struggle is that Jesus has already overcome and that when he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to live that perfect life in us and through us, we become perfect in the sense of fully functional as we allow the Holy Spirit to live this life in us and through us. And that's why we have to be sensitive as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And he doesn't just rely upon that, that convicting voice. We also have the word of God. That's why Ellen White says that those who are not diligent students of the word will never be in God's kingdom. Because we need that connection. We need that vitality, that transforming power that comes through the word of God, just as you read it. You may not feel anything happening. It's not a feeling. It's a transforming power that changes the way you think and empowers you to make choices and decisions that you wouldn't make other than having been in connection with that influence. So the necessity is that God requires of us the permission, he has accomplished it for us, but now he must accomplish it in us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we need to remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings will ever or can ever dwell in his presence. And also Revelation 7 tells us several times that the him that overcometh God is not offering something to us of which is not a possibility. He's always telling us to him that overcometh. To the churches, he says that to, uh, well, I can't say every church, but I believe in most of the churches in Revelation 3, uh, 2 and 3, that God makes this promise to the overcomers. The promise of eternal inheritance is not for those merely who believe, but for those whose faith claims the Savior's abiding presence day by day, and who thus learn to overcome inherited 
and cultivated tendencies of evil. The question was asked of our Lord by one who had been impressed with the master's imperative call for a life of holiness, to meet the need of the human heart, to be warned against spiritual indolence, Jesus replied, strive to enter in at the straight gate for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. Many will seek and shall not be able. They do not have the perfection of character God requires of those who will be citizens of his eternal kingdom. Because he says in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's obvious that those who eventually are accounted worthy must go through a school of discipline in order to obtain the necessary fitness for heaven. That, the school of discipline is not an easy one. And as I mentioned before in Luke 12, 34, Jesus says, strive. And in the original Greek word, it simply, it means agonize, which suggests an intensity of purpose. It's not easy overcoming sin in our life and allowing God to be in control. It is not easy. But we have the assurance of being overcomers. And that if we choose to be in the presence of God, if we choose to keep our thoughts upon him and be constantly aware of his presence with us, as we read his word, as we take counsel from the spirit of prophecy, there is a transformation that takes place. Just as the transformation was seen in the disciples when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, it says that they took notice that they had been with Jesus. And so it will be in our lives, in our homes, first of all, that people, your husband, your wife, your children will be able to see that you have been with Jesus. Because it's a different way in which you speak, in which you respond to various situations that may create impatience. But God's transforming power is sufficient. But why is it that so many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, but will not be saved. Why is it? It is because they have never decided. You know that old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. You know within yourself when you decide to do something, you're going to focus on it until it's accomplished. It may take you several goes at it. You know, I've been building a, a cement retainer wall and it's taken me several weeks to do it but I keep going back and doing another section another section why because I determined to finish that wall and I'm going to only have one more short section to do but it's going to be completed and it's the same way in our life when you decide to do something then the power of the Holy Spirit is there to accomplish it for you it's never in your strength but it's in the strength of God so the Bible assures us that we are to be those who will be a part of God's kingdom are accounted worthy. We have to go through a school of discipline. We have to strive. We have to agonize. It takes effort because our human nature wants to go one way and we keep stumbling and falling. But you know, it's like an army, like an army fighting a war. Just because some people fall doesn't mean we give up fighting battle. We just have to get up. No good man stumble and fall seven times. You know, he gets up. And you and I are responsible for helping one another. You know, when a brother falls, the Bible says we're to help them get up. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So we are also not called only to fight our battles. But as we hope other people fight their battles, as we encourage one another, that we find that we ourselves are growing and maturing and strengthening in this relationship with God. So that's where it's going to come from. It's not just in our overcoming, but the more you help other people overcome, 
by holding on to your tongue so it doesn't irritate them and cause them to speak out impatiently. That's how we grow in our relationship, in our preparation. So there is, that's the necessity. The next section is the difficulty. We've already covered part of this, but let's look at it. While our, Lord, while our Lord often encouraged his disciples by assuring them victory through him, yet nevertheless, he also often solemnly spoke of the difficulties they would meet. He set forth the perils that they would face, the power of the tempter, the strength and enmity of the world, <laughs> their own human weakness, and the necessity of faith, courage, and trust in him in the face of adversity. And of course, we know that Jesus has told us that our greatest enemies are going to be even among our own household. They'll be in your church. We know where the enemies are. Jesus has identified it. But uh, as difficult as it may be, that our focus and our attention on God and our relationship with him is where our strength comes from. Matthew 24, 12, and 13, it says, because iniquity, that means gross injustice, wickedness shall abound. And I am uh, just commenting to my wife this morning, I am amazed that Australia has not suffered greater natural calamities than it has up to this point. I mean, if you watch the news this week and see how Europe and other countries have been pounded uh, with hail and with flooding, it, it is just amazing how much of natural, you know, disaster from natural calamities, billions and billions of dollars worth of damage in this, just this past week. It says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of God shall wax cold. But he shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I just interrupted my thought there. And the thought was about Australia is the fact that when we have actually, when our governments have shut God out, our schools, our whole community, our whole society has shut God out, and we have condoned and legalized gross sin. It is amazing that judgment hasn't fallen upon this land yet, it will. I'm sure that it's coming because whenever they have made that choice and leave God completely out of society, that uh, the devil will wreak havoc. I'm sure that it's coming sooner than we think. And all who eventually reign with Christ in glory will have experienced the strength of the evil which they inherited by their natural birth. Every one of us within our human nature, it is corrupt, it's evil. And only, only God can deal with that. And he's not going to deal with it by changing us. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, as, as good a man, as righteous a man as you are, that you think you are, Nicodemus. The only way that you will ever be saved is to be born again. You have to have a whole new heart, a whole new nature, a whole new mind. That's why the Bible says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because God requires more than mere outward conformity to human standards. More than a righteousness based upon social ethics. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the, law, <clears throat> the law of God covers the thoughts and motives. And these can be purified and controlled only by divine power. When Jesus says you must to Nicodemus, it's a divine imperative <clears throat> to be controlled by God. We must bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. The springs of human thought and action must be cleaned and kept clean by the power of God dwelling within. As you know, in Jeremiah 13, 23, it says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to doing evil. God says it's impossible. No leopard's going to change his spots. Can't do it. 
Ethiopian can't change his skin. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. The impossibility of the unaided human heart reaching the divine standard is illustrated in the experiences of Paul until he learned the secret of victory through the indwelling spirit of God, he lamented in Romans 7. You're familiar with that, his lamentations. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. It is no more I that do it, but sin dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. That was the plight, but then we go to Romans chapter 8. But thanks be to God who give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So point four is the manner of accomplishment. The Bible gives us the assurance in Zechariah 12, 8. He that is feeble among them at, at that day shall be as David. Of course, this encouraging promise of victory assures us that all who receive the spirit of grace and supplications, that as youthful, inexperienced David defeated Goliath and other enemies in the strength of God, so would they also be conquerors over their foes. He that is feeble can be made strong enough to overcome every enemy. And of course, you have the words of the hymn. It says, I am satisfied to know that with Jesus here below, I can conquer every foe. With Jesus, I triumph still if thou abide with me. So what are the assurances? Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. David went out there to fight Goliath, not in his strength or his ability. He had never faced a giant before, but he faced it in the assurance that God would fight the battle. So that's why you can claim victory. You fall over flat, you mess up, you speak, act, behave, whatever it is, and you have to get up and shout victory. Just get up and shout victory. Just as they did there around Jericho. That's how we have to fight, because our song of victory is based upon the assurance that Jesus has already lived our life victoriously. He has, uh, he overcame. I have overcome. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, Allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of your life. Allow him, his strength, his power, his wisdom to live your life for you. Because it's a life of victory. It's a life of joy, a life of peace. Because now you're not fighting the battles. You're letting God do it. And you're seeing the enemy toppled over. You will see it. <clears throat> Whatever the enemy is in your life, if you will claim victory, you will see the enemy topple. He will fall. He will fall, and you will be victorious. And remember, Goliath was the only battle that David fought. He fought many battles. And so you will too. You may fight one battle today, but there's another one tomorrow. But just as you won this battle today in the strength of God, you will win tomorrow's battle in his strength. It's not about seeing how many things you can overcome but it's allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you and search your heart and to deal with those things in the manner and in the, uh, the sequence in which he wants to deal with you. That's why we can't come along and tell other people, oh, you shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be doing that. Just as someone was mentioning before we began the service of how a man was discouraged because people kept telling him what to do. No. That is not for us to do. It is up, it's for us to love those people and accept them in their condition. And then if you see something that needs to be changed in their life, you pray for them and let and see what God can do in changing their life. Because when the Holy Spirit convicts them and they know what they need to do, 
and God, the Holy Spirit guides them and gives them wisdom in dealing with it, uh, then it's a much greater victory if you just come along and say, you need to change this or that. That's not our work. But we have the assurance. Ephesians 3.16, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. The key is the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no victory. There is no victory. There is no even motivation for victory. Because the Holy Spirit not only motivates us, convicts us, but he also fights the battle for us. He is the one who wins. In 1 John 5, verse 4 and 5, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So no matter what your life may be like today, no matter what the battles are, the issues are in your life that you're facing. And I have talked with people this week who face all kinds of issues, not just in their own life, but in in their uh, life, uh, in their families, uh, conflict in relationships. But God is saying, it's faith. Do you trust me that I can handle this situation? Because God already knew what you were going to face. He knew exactly what you were going to face. And he knows how to win. He knows how to win the battle. And you may go about it in ways that, like David, everyone else thought he was crazy absolutely crazy to go out there and face Goliath with his armor bearer, this giant of a man with his sword and his spear, and he goes out there with stones. God's going to fight your battle, and he will win if you will just claim victory by faith, no matter what's happening. Like Peter, when he was sinking there in the water after he asked the Lord to ask, you know, give him permission to come out and walk on the water. And then he took his eyes off of Christ and he was sinking. But the moment he said, Lord, Jesus was there beside him to pull him back up to the surface. In the same way, our own life, we are sinking. God says, just call on my name. Call on my name. Second Chronicles 20, verse 17 to 24. You remember that story where they went out to battle? There was no way that they could win this battle. There was too many people to fight, too many on the, uh, on, on the enemy side. But it says, and when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, praise the Lord set ambushments against their enemies. The overthrow of their mighty foes was due to God's intervention on behalf of his trusting people. Zechariah 4, 6 says, victory comes not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 59, verse 19 says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Or in the margin, it says, put him to flight. Romans 8, 11, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8, 26 and Romans 8, 11, God shall also quicken our mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So there are the promises that we have in the word of God. And you'll note in, in Daniel 11 and verse 32, it says, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Micah 7, 19 says, he will subdue our iniquities. Romans eleven twenty seven. 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. These are the promises of God. 
You know, like that old song goes, we just sang in Sabbath school today, standing on the promises of Christ, my King. This is what God has promised so that whenever we stumble and fall, whenever we're discouraged by circumstances of, of impossibilities, that God says, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to turn it over to me and, and just stand still and see the goodness of the Lord? That's what the Sabbath is. It's a time of coming and saying, Lord, I want to publicly demonstrate that I rest in you. I trust you. I trust you. And then start singing. Sing that song of victory. Even though it hasn't come yet, it will come. You will be victorious. And let God do his perfect work and his perfect will in, in your life. Then we go to the experience of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He says of the Lord, my strength is made perfect in weakness. He also said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You just think of what Jesus had to deal with with his disciples. Those explosive natures of James and John. Petuous name of the you know, character of Peter. The doubting nature of Thomas. But it was by fellowship with Christ. It was by spending that time with him that their lives were changed. And when the Holy Spirit came in and wrought this transformation, then their life became transformed. And so it is with you, my brothers and sisters who are listening today, that God will transform your life. Let him continue to work. Don't try and put parameters on what should happen, what should change in your life. You just come into his presence. Live in his presence. Keep, his, keep your thoughts upon him. And by faith, claim his promises. And you will see a transformed life. But you have to claim victory. You can't just want it desire it, hope for it, believe in it, you have to actually take action. David didn't win the battle with Goliath until he went out there and faced the enemy. Then he was given victory. And he ran toward the giant. He didn't just saunter over and wait for the giant to come to him. He ran toward the giant. And so you and I have to run toward those issues in our life that keep us from that perfect character because God is going to transform you. He is preparing you to live in heaven in a holy atmosphere and he will search your heart. He will try you. He will reveal to you those things in your nature, in your life that need to be changed, that need to be removed because, and that's going to happen by the law of displacement. As the Holy Spirit comes in, selfishness goes out love and kindness and gentleness and patience come in not by effort but by allowing the holy spirit to come and take up residence in in our lives so that's my message to you today i just pray for god to be with you and guide you in this triumphant life because remember we will shine as lights we will be the light in the darkness of this world and how soon it's going to come it will always be sooner than you think. Always sooner than you think. Maybe not as soon as you desire, but sooner than you think. You think of these uprisings like in the ethnic cleansing in Rwanda. Suddenly, overnight, people who had been friends, neighbors, companions, were suddenly turned against each other and became ruthless enemies that would, without a thought, to take their neighbor's life. We don't know when this is going to happen, but whatever has happened in the world so far does not compare with the evil that is coming. And it will come with sudden blindness. You will not see it coming, as Jesus said, in an hour you think not. So don't ever believe that you're looking down the road and say, well, this has come in a year or two years. Folks, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when Jesus comes. The fact is, and the point is, that we are ready. We are ready for Jesus to come today, right now. 
and that we are we are willing and ready to receive the perfection of his character today and we have it by faith as we shout in victory that you are an overcomer so don't ever be discouraged by your weaknesses your faults your failures but rejoice in what god has done and what he will continue to do and the work that he began in you he will complete he will complete it father in heaven we thank you for the assurance of your word we thank you for the blessed promises that you give to us that we have no reason to ever become discouraged except we can throw off that mantle of darkness of despair of discouragement and replace it with the, the brightness of your presence the power of your promises that you have you have overcome and that's why we are overcomers and that one day soon that we will stand on those sea of glass and rejoice with that vast multitude of people who have fought the, who have fought the same battle but who have won it in the strength of your might. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.